Hi, my name is Rosemary Chimbranda and I'd like to thank the Medford After Dark for inviting me to share my knowledge about Sadza Batik. In this presentation, I'm going to cover for you what Sadza Batik is, the process of creating Sadza Batik, and then I'm going to show you some projects that you can accomplish using Sadza Batik. I grew up in Zimbabwe, um, where Sadza is the staple food. Indeed, it is the staple food for most African countries. It may be referred to as ugali or fufu in other countries, but the concept is basically the same. Uh, it's a mixture of um, a grain flour with cold water, and then that's cooked into um, a solid, semi-solid um, substance that you can then dip into radishes like meat, or vegetables and then um, that would be your basic meal. Um, some of the grains that are used to create sadza are sorghum and millet but cornmeal is mostly used for sadza batiking because it's most plentiful and it's the cheapest. So today we're going to do um, batiking use the sadza flour. Um, started working with fabric from a young age. Uh, during my pre-adolescent years, growing up in the village, we used to make dolls out of clay. So we had to make outfits for our dolls. So the competition was on, on who was going to produce the most beautiful outfit for their dolls. Um, when I went to primary school, I was now more formally trained in sewing techniques and introducing some beautiful graphics onto plain fabric. So we were taught tie and dyeing. We were taught potato printing. This is where you cut potatoes into some, you know, designs creating a stamp. And then you dip the stamp into some ink and then you um, stamp your fabric with whatever design you want. And then Sadza Batik, which is, we're going, which is what we are going to uh, cover today. Uh, as I went to college, um, these skills became very helpful because I was able to continue sewing for people to supplement my scholarship. So I made money that way. And then after I moved to America a few years ago, I continued. For me now, this was something more relaxing as I was working uh, a nine to five as a software engineer. So I continued batiking and even learned some shibori, which is uh, a Japanese technique of introducing graphics onto fabric and, um, you know, the sewing. So let's get started with the ingredients. These are the basic ingredients that we use for Sadza Batik. You're going to need the corn flour we are going to need the water and the water has to be cold so you're going to mix two parts of water to one part of the cornmeal your pot of course and a ladle so that you um, can cook in there your measuring cup you're going to need fabric ink. It has to be ink, not paint. You see? So this is um, what I'm going to use. You're going to use need um, a squeezable bottle because this is where we are going to put the sadza resist. Uh, so you want to be able to squeeze it out, to squeeze the bottle. So you don't want a rigid bottle that you are not going to be able to squeeze, especially when you're going to um, make some precision designs. You're going to want to use a squeezable bo bo uh, bottle with a small nozzle. We're going to have some brushes for applying the ink onto the fabric. Sometimes you need a bigger brush if you're covering a bigger area and your fabric. I 
we usually use cotton because it's more receptive to ink and I always use something at the back like cardboard this way it can um, not only support the fabric as I work especially since I'm going to be moving uh, the fabric uh, to some place in the sun so that it can dry so when you lift the fabric it's going to need some support because it's going to be very heavy with the sudsa porridge so that's um, what we're going to do so next I'm going to show you how to make the sudsa porridge and put it into the um, squeeze squeegee bottle and then we are going to apply the sudsa onto the fabric okay I am going to now start cooking the sadza porridge. So here is my measuring cup. I'm going to do one cup of the cornmeal and then two cups of the water. So I want to, I need to mix it thoroughly first before I put it on the stove to avoid creating lumps. We don't want lumps. They look like uh, dumplings and they will not be able to come through the squeezy uh, bottle nozzle. And also you don't want a lamp to sit on your fabric because it will create a very big resist area where you may not need one. Okay, so now this is the texture of the mixture of the cold water and the cornmeal. And then you put it on the stove to cook. I'm going to do this on high. So here is the sadza. It's now bubbling. So you let it cook for about five minutes or so like that. So depending on how finely ground uh, your corn flour is, you may need a little bit less or a little bit more if it's finely ground then you need less but if it's gritty then you may need more but uh, that's the you want to create that kind of bubbling texture that i just showed you so just adjust it depending on what kind of corn flour you found so now this is uh, the porridge and it's hot i'm going to pour it into the bottle You may want to use a mitten to handle um, the bottle as this is hot porridge. So if it's a project that you want to do with youngsters, you should do it under supervision. I'm going to use um, this towel just to handle the, the bottle. Okay, so I am going to do some free designs on this fabric just so you can see um, how it goes and what it looks like when it comes out. So I want you, you want to let the air out first, otherwise the porridge is going to shoot out and it may mess up your fabric. I just drew that design freehand so it's um, not a very thick layer but it has some substance to it you can see so this is if you want to create some graphics some patterns on to your fabric 
or if you want um, to cover the whole area and then uh, you do your batik there, which is uh, the example that I'm going to show you today. You just spread a whole large area and then you use a brush or whatever tool you can find. To spread the porridge onto the fabric like that you can do some dots So that's all sadza porridge on the fabric. And at this stage in the project, you need for the sadza to dry. Um, in Zimbabwe, they usually just put it out in the sun. It may take a couple of days. Um, uh, here I, in Boston, I just put my sadza fabric on a radiator so that it can dry. So as it dries, it's going to crack and it's going to distort um, the fabric, you know, out of shape. So we are going to see how that looks in the next phase. I'm going to do a run through of the whole process of creating a uh, sansa batik. So you start off uh, with your fabric pre-washed. You want to wash it so that um, it shrinks, especially if you're working with cotton. It needs to be pre-shrunk. That way, your designs are not going to be distorted once you put them onto the fabric. The other reason why you want to pre-wash your fabric is because um, they put a sheen on fabric so that it looks attractive when you get it from the store. So that sheen in itself is a resist, so it's going to resist your ink from penetrating the fabric. So you do not want that. You want uh, to pre-wash your fabric and then you iron it flat so that your designs go on properly. The second stage, we are going to now put the porridge onto the fabric. You see, I created those four dots the way I demonstrated in a prior section. And then at the bottom part, I just spread the porridge all over and then um, put it on a um, cardboard at the back so that I can transport it to the drying area without um, the fabric you know, touching onto itself and smearing the porridge all over where I do not want it. So you put this in the sun for um, maybe two to three days until it's completely dry. In the sun, it may take a couple of days. So um, you can probably see how much porridge there is in there. You do not want too much because then it may take unnecessarily long to dry. As it dries, the fabric is going to curl up, as you can see, and cracks are beginning to form. This is what it's going to look like. So the ink only penetrates to the fabric through the cracks that you see. If you, you are not satisfied with the amount of cracking that occurred, you can introduce some more cracks onto your fabric by using a rolling pin until your fabric is flat again. So you do it from the wrong side of the fabric and then you just roll back and forth until the fabric is flat and you are satisfied with the amount of cracks on your fabric. That's what's going to create the pattern for you. So the next stage, you're now going to apply ink. 
all over the Sada areas where your design is going to appear and the ink is going to find its way through the cracks that you created you let this dry it may be four hours in the sun and after it's dry you iron the fabric to set the ink permanently onto the fabric you may want to do the ironing from the wrong side of the fabric once the ink is set you now can wash your fabric to remove the sadza residue and this is what you're going to have in the end it's going to look like that it's going to be beautiful so um, from this I want you to notice um, a few mistakes that one can create you see around the dots if all I wanted were just the dots and not that extra ink around my dots it means I needed a bigger Sadza area and then I just focus my ink from within um, the Sadza dots also you don't want your ink to be too watery sometimes um, the ink comes too thick and you may want to add a drop or two of water just so that you know it's easier to get through the cracks but if you make it too watery then it's going to blot um, to some areas of your fabric where you don't want the ink to go like in this area here you can see the, bl see the blot so in this case the ink went through the cracks to the other side of the fabric to the wrong side of the fabric and then it, it's found its way underneath the sadza resist so watch out for that behind me you can see some projects that we can accomplish using sadza batik here i have A graphic design so here it's a combination of creating sada batik this is the area where it's batik it was done freehand and some fabric painting you can always tell whether what you are looking at is fabric painted on or if it's batik because if it's batik you're going to see the cracks in the fabric This is all batik work. You can see the cracking in the design. So you can see you can make pillows, you can make wall hangings, you can make, uh, make large murals using Santa batik. We have a guinea hen here. So I'm just going to walk through uh, to show you how you can create something like this so as you can see the guinea hen itself is brown so that's part of the um, background color of the fabric so if you were to make something like this from scratch let's say a white fabric these are the steps that you may want to do you may want to just paint so these are the steps that you may want to go through when you are creating uh, the guinea hen you may start off by just sketching it out where you want your guinea hen and maybe a border the second stage I painted background colors now you see for the guinea hen the background color is bigger and not as well defined as the guinea hen that I want to create that's part of the process 
So for the definition of the guinea hen happens with the sadza porridge. So this is where that um, nozzle comes in handy for definition. So you are going to make the outline of the guinea hen using the sadza porridge. And all the other areas around the guinea hen uh, that were brown, you cover with the sadza so that um, you can then put um, some ink, whatever color you want to be surrounding the guinea hen. And then you go through that whole process again of uh, drying the sadza batik, applying the ink, and you have your design. My name is Rosemary Timbanda. This is my contact information. Maybe we'll get together at some point and maybe we'll go um, into further detail on how to create um, the more advanced projects. Thank you. So thanks, Rosemary. That was really, really interesting. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, okay. And I know that you are not able to actually be live for the event. So I'm just going to ask you some questions that um, came up for me while I was listening to the video, uh, watching the video. And um, hopefully you'll be able to, to give us some helpful answers. Um, and I want to start right at the beginning of your video where you said that you were raised in Zimbabwe um, and ask you if you wouldn't mind to tell us just a little bit about what it was like to grow up there and um, coming to the United States if if you want to talk about that or just you know curious about how how you lived there and whether you learned arts and crafts in the traditional style while you were there you know all those kinds of things, whatever you want to say. Yes, I grew up in Zimbabwe. I grew up in a rural setting um, where there's no running water and there's no electricity. And we had to walk, um, you know, maybe five, six miles to get to the nearest school. So that's the kind of environment where I grew up. And arts and crafts were emphasized because uh, Zimbabwe being, being a third world country, uh, we were being groomed to create art for the tourist industry. That's one of the major products that, um, you know, brings income to the country. So yes, arts and crafts were emphasized wow. throughout my childhood. That's, that's really fascinating. So what did you learn? I mean, I'm assuming you learned how to do sadza batik. What else did you learn how to do when you were a child? I also learned how to do potato printing, tie dyeing. We also had to make um, table mats out of sisal fiber. So you actually had to make um, the fiber itself, extracting it from the uh, sisal leaf, all the way to um, putting some color onto it, you know, dyeing the sisal fiber and then weaving it and then make the table mat out of it. And I also learned how to make things out of clay. Uh, people in the villages, they usually don't have the metal pots for cooking. Right. So our cooking um, is done in clay pots. So we also learned how to make those. Wow. Yes. You could, you could survive anywhere on all those skills. <laughs> So how did you get from a rural village in the middle of the countryside of Zimbabwe to the United States? What brought you here? Well, um, rural life was very difficult. And my mother always told me that if you don't want to live this kind of a lifestyle, you have to work very hard at school. Mm. So that was my only way out. So I worked very hard at school and ended up getting a scholarship uh, to come to America. Oh, that's how that happened. It was uh, an escape from poverty. Wow. And where where was the scholarship to? I already oh. had a, a bachelor's degree from the University of Zimbabwe in economics. And then I wanted to venture into computer science. 
at the time, uh, computer science was not offered in Zimbabwe. So I had to come over here to do it. So I ended up studying computer science at Northeastern University. And that's how I got into software engineering. So I was a software engineer in Boston for more than 20 years. Wow. So a uh, little different weather between Zimbabwe and Boston, huh? It's, it's not as bad, uh, the difference in the weather patterns. Um, when you are in Africa, all they talk about is how cold it is. They skip uh, the part that there also is a summer, you know, in America. So now I've got a couple of really specific questions about your technique. Um, when you were putting on the cornmeal, um, it looked kind of thick going on sometimes, but then after you showed the dried parts, it seemed like it wasn't thick anymore. And so I'm curious, does, does it matter how thick the cornmeal is and, and does it flatten as it dries? And is that part of the point? So you don't want it to be too thin going in the first time then it's just going to sink into the fabric and you're not going to get much cracking. That's, that's great advice, thank you. Um, let's see what else. Um, and I was thinking about how long it takes for the cornmeal to dry and I'm kind of an impatient person. <laughs> I wanna see results right away. I'm wondering, um, what do you think about using like a hair dryer or, um, a desiccating oven like you you dry um, fruit in or something like that if you were really careful with it not to cause a fire or you know or maybe like heating your oven up a little bit and then turning it off like you would proof bread do you think okay. those things might work uh i don't know you've got to be careful about putting the fabric in the oven because you might scorch right. it right you know? and right. There, are, there is some thickness, uh, so putting it in the oven, you know, I don't know how long that will take, but hey, it's worth trying. And usually in Zimbabwe, you are working on a large piece of fabric, it's too big to go in the oven, because you don't want to fold the fabric and then put it in the oven. Right. You just smear the porridge all over. And but you probably, yeah, that's true. But you probably also have a lot of a lot more sun and hot days where it's going to dry. Yeah, yes. like I, I wouldn't even. I think I wouldn't even try this here in the winter. It would just be too aggravating to wait that long. Yes. <laughs> Plus, my cat would want to play with it. <laughs> Wet cornmeal pads all over the house. Um, <laughs> Would not be that would not be pretty. Um, so I had another question about washing the cornmeal. Um, should you do that in a sink or a separate tub or something? I'm I'm just wondering. Like, does the cornmeal get lumpy and stick, and and would that be a problem in your drains? Should you put it in the in the washing machine? How do you do it? Okay. Oh, uh, when you. Uh, when you wash it, um, it's going to be lumpy because it's like cooked um, sada particles. It's almost like a rice texture at that point. So uh, if you wash it in a washing machine, I don't know how well that's going to go. So I usually just wash it in a sink and then I have the drain thing catch everything. And it doesn't ever clog up your drain. I don't let it go down the drain, you know, but eventually I'm sure it can um, dissolve because it's just cornmeal material. Mm. Right, right. Fabric ink at that point. Right, right. Okay. But it does come off in clumps. Yeah. Right. Um, So here's our last question for you um, that we can think of right now. Um, so when I have looked at pictures of this batik method, it looks like there's a lot of pretty dark colors that you use. 
And I'm wondering, are, are certain kinds of colors more successful than others in this technique? And um, you can talk a little bit about, you know, what colors you think work best for the things that you've done or that you've liked the best in um, other sets of batik art that you've seen? No, I don't I think it's more of what color you use. It's just the effect that you want. I use um, a dark blue color because I wanted the contrast to really show and so that people can actually see the crack and they can relate to the method, how the ink penetrated through the crack onto the fabric. That's why I chose uh, that okay. color. Okay, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. and, and you also mentioned, I thought of one other thing. You also mentioned that you use cotton a lot um, and you wash it to get out the sizing. Um, are there any other successful kinds of natural fibers like linen or rayon or things like that that, that you've tried that you think also might be worth giving it a go? The fiber, linen, um, if the fibers are not going to be, to be expected to be ink. So that mm -hmm. could be the desired effect that you just kind of like want a white or a light color right. to whatever you are doing because right. it doesn't need to be like vivid in your face kind of boldness of coloring. Right. right. Yeah, just make sure you use ink and not paint. Ink yes. is going to go through the cracks to uh, create the pattern. Right. Paint is just going to sit on top of mm. the sadza and it won't penetrate and you won't be able to get to the sadza to wash it off. So right. it reads your, uh, the labels very carefully to find out what it is that you're purchasing. Okay, great. Thanks for the advice. Thanks again, Rosemary. Have have a great trip and we will be putting this video up on YouTube and you can watch it when you come home. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.